Welcome back once again. This is Amuna Yisrael. Solanomics, Live Project, all this good stuff. Rainy day, can't go outside yet. Summer day, taking some news. Greetings and welcome back once again, everybody. So I'm here taking in some news, translation, and um, it's been a while. And I watched a video, and I want to share, as you can see from the title, very briefly, a little bit of critical thinking. Now, I have been approaching this conversation from an informative position of just sharing information, historically um, engaging in discussions that hopefully helps us to gain a level of clarity about what has happened concerning this conversation on reparations, okay? So, um, I'm posing an if-then statement right about now in that very same vein. The name of this is uh, Dr. William Diarty, quote, should first and second generation European immigrants pay for reparations? So I'm watching this uh, video that someone just put up on YouTube where uh, Dr. Diarty was on, and if it's raining loud and you can hear it, if it's raining and you can hear me, put up your hand. Just, you know what I'm saying? Wait, 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 wait. Continue to vibe with it. Um, so I was listening intently to what he was saying because a lot of people are like, he's the one uh, in, that ADOS is getting a lot of information from. So I'm, I'm listening because, you know, I got no time today. So he, it came to a part in the video at 10.52. So I'm going to play and stop, play and stop, and ask some questions. And, and the, um, I'm going to be using the if-then scenario. I remember in uh, class back in college, you know, it's this if then statements. If then, then that, right? So the question that the caller actually, he's responding, whoa, woo, it's tenderly. <laughs> the babies is hollering. The, he's responding to the caller saying, beware of people who are saying that their foreparents, European people, were not here during slavery. Actually, I should let the caller speak for himself. Hold on, so that we're not we're not saying the moon is. So let me go back here. Hold on. The ways of what we do that we deal with in the serious. Okay, what's going on here? Okay. Matter by which um, you're dealing with it this morning. Now, uh, with the. Uh, let me know if you can hear it. You know, Hold on. Approaching the topic the way she did. I, I agree with you, brother, was much a noble thing to do. Now, watch this, my brother, as this program progress. Where okay, so it's a brother calling in, and he's giving him a, a, a warning to say, be careful, okay? So I'm going to, if you can't hear it, then I'm just stopping it intermittently. Call in and said, I, my parents, um, I just got here. You know, um, I'm second generation, and my people came from wherever. We ain't had... Okay, so the call is saying, the call is saying that 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 many Europeans, in which we've heard this argument, many Europeans say, "I just got here from wherever they came from, from Italy, from Scotland, from wherever. They just got here, um, new immigrants, and their parents had nothing to do with slavery." Okay. And you also get uh, the the garden variety races who will always uh, um, give the Confederate line about, um, you know, that slavery was actually a noble em enterprise. That the and you do see that as well as people saying, uh, they got you help, we helped you out and if it wasn't for us. And so he's telling him, because he's on C-SPAN, so he's basically telling him to listen out for these type of callers, okay? Uh, your uh, understanding. So, but brother, I think you got your 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 your, your finger on the pulse of the direction by which we must go with this. But I'm just saying, be be aware of how it is that these various uh, and there's some pauses in the video for oppositions mm -hmm. uh, will try to muddy the water. Dave, uh, that's David from uh, Los Angeles, Professor. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, let me so he's concerned about muddying the waters. We hear this statement a lot about concern about muddying the waters. Thank you, those who just joined us. I'm going over this video that I just saw. Let me, let me go let me go in here. I've been reading the comments on it. Very interesting. But the video is titled, it's on C-SPAN. 
And someone uploaded it, Dr. Darity on reparations, March 2019. So I would press play. I've already commented on, on the necessity of, of changing the way in which we view the American historical record. Uh, but, but the observation, the other important observation that the caller made is that uh, frequently critics of reparations say that they are such recent immigrants to the United States that uh, they don't bear any uh, per personal responsibility. Okay. So, so we're gonna listen for keywords now, right? We just doing it. We just doing a scenario. Everybody, stay cool. It's all good. So this is an if-then scenario, right? That I'm looking at it at. This first response is often critics. So these are people who are opposing. This would be people who are um, saying that they are not personally responsible. So this will have to be the ruling class or those who are getting benefits from uh, being within the ruling class or those who are, are favored, right? So let's continue. Uh oh, hold on. Or for slavery, for example. Uh, uh, they may even have, have arrived so recently that they, uh, they've they come after the Jim Crow period had ended. Uh, but I, I, I've got a couple of responses. So these are new, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm telling you guys right now, I'm looking at it through the lens of the way in which many people, I'm not saying him, but many people who represent the ADOS community speak of the other side of the spectrum. There's two sides of the spectrum. One side of the spectrum is the concern of European people who are saying they just came here and they're not responsible for what you're trying to hold everybody else responsible. The other side of the spectrum is melanated people who ones are saying just came here and they are, they did not quote experience what those who were born and um, bones were buried here experienced, and therefore they should not be compensated. Now look at this. We're talking about just weights and measures, right? We have two sides of the equation just for clarity. This is how I'm looking at this if then statement. So whatever Dr. Darity is about to, to, to forward to the listening audience, my question is just for entertainment purposes, if it applies on one side, then should we be applying the same logic on the other side? So again, in this particular case, it's not speaking about melanated people, it's speaking about European people who just came here and they should, and the question of whether or not they should be responsible, it's raining, boy. Whether or not they should be responsible for uh, slavery. Okay, listen to what he says. Let me know, first of all, let me know if you guys can hear, because this sounds kind of low. Can you hear? I'm not, I don't know how people are able to, I think I might need external speakers because I know other YouTubers play the sound and you can hear from their screen, but mine doesn't work. So I might have to work on some external speakers. But let me know if you can hear, put a one in the thing but while I continue. Let me know if you can hear, because I want you to hear this part. All right. Responses to that type of uh, perspective. The first is if uh, if an individual migrates to a country, they migrate to its history and to its national obligations. If an individual migrates to a company, then they migrate to their history and their national obligations. Now, speaking of Europeans who migrated here. If then, remember the if then statement, okay? Digital cinema, welcome to the discussion. Let me know if you can hear me. The national obligation is what's in question, in question here. It's not a matter of personal responsibility or individual responsibility. It's a national obligation that's based on the historical experiences that the United States of America has has, has undergone. Uh, so, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm hearing is that those who come here and benefit from what was done inherit to a certain degree the things that took place, loud and clear, cool. They inherit to a certain degree the things that took place even though they weren't here they inherit that. So my question is, if that is applicable on one side, then those who come here and are um, inherit the, the injustices, inherit the oppression, inherit, inherit the prejudices, how is it saying, how are we saying, how is he saying on one side for the European to pay up, it's applicable, but on the other side, get back, you know what I'm saying? You immigrant, question. 
I'm just saying that. This is just for critical thinking, y'all. This is just for critical thinking. Let me continue. And I would also add that I, I presume that people who have chosen to migrate to the United States have chosen to do so based on the opportunity structure that exists now, uh, which is also a product of the level of affluence that the United States as a country as a whole has achieved. And that level of affluence was built on the backs of black American culture worse labor that uh, that that was uh, what that went on for upwards of, of three to four generations in the United States after the formation of the Republic. So what uh, we're hearing is more than the blood and soil argument. What we're hearing is the contributions, the Im immigrants who came here on one side benefited and on the other side, immigrants who came here contributed to the affluence. So other immigrants, melanated immigrants from other places that came in league with their brothers and sisters here and contributed so that someone else can benefit. How are we saying on one side that you gotta pay because you benefited, but on the other side, and I'm gonna keep saying this because when I was listening to it, I was like, wait, hold up. We gotta apply the if then, hypothetically, I'm just saying. From Maggie and so okay, that that was the end of that. That was I'm gonna put that in the box. That was at the about the 10 minute mark, um, about 10 30 minute mark. You can go back and take a listen to that. I'm and 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 I just wanted to bring it up. You know, so I had a little time because it was raining outside. But question, question, it, it, it has to be just weights. The Torah says just weights and balances is the most high delight, right? So we have to look at this at just weights and balances. This is what I have been sharing. And have been talking about that this this is it's not a cut and dry situation and it's actually a layered situation this is why he brings up jim crow but brings up jim crow concerning the europeans who were on the other side of jim crow who may have been recent immigrants but they also benefited from what would the, the ongoing narrative that was already happening in this country so it would be the case for people who came in during the Jim Crow era who were not in slavery or also free people, freedmen. This is going to be something that's going to be very interesting because there's so much record of freedmen here who did suffer but were not enslaved. So how does one say that because you were not enslaved, that means you did not suffer and that, that also means that you did not build to or that you did not contribute to the building of this, this country? That's not, I keep saying stuff like, that's not true. Like, how are we going to deal, deal with those things, those very true realities concerning history? Another wild thing, let me fast forward here to, um, uh, art, to what this uh, caller says at the end. And I kind of wanted to read an article, I guess I didn't get to read the other day. So let's jump to the end here. It was definitely in Hold progress. On. There definitely was a, a there were def people that had nothing to do with okay. that. I think that the, the, the case for reparations is not. All right, we're going to listen to the, this guy here, this caller. That uh, it's, it's critical that we take into account in, in, our, in our calibrations the long term effects of the Jim Crow period. And I also indicated he said that before that that is not only about slavery that need to be mm -hmm. considered. And I would highlight among these again mass incarceration, police killings of unarmed blacks, and the uh, the immense magnitude of the racial wealth gap. So it's not just a question of addressing the harms of slavery. Uh, I think that, uh, as I've said a number of times, if people believe that there are other communities or other groups that are deserving of some form of compensation, they need to make that case. But this is a case that's specific to the experience of Native Black Americans. And this experience is one in which I'm trying to take into account a long and cumulative trajectory of injustices that have been imposed upon this community, starting with slavery. And so back to the original question, if the case is for native, melanated people, because y'all know I'm like black, 
native melanated people, then wouldn't the case also be for native European people? So it has to be, it can't be an apple over here and an orange over here. If the cases are concerning, yes, you experience these things, other peoples who came here with melanin, but you weren't native. Then it would have to be the same on the other side. Yes, you you benefited from uh yes, you benefited from the institution of slavery, but you weren't your four parents are native, meaning you weren't here or you weren't the ones who brought them here. Let me know if I'm wrong in the comment section. That, that, or if you say, like he said, that yes, even though you aren't native European person, you are benefiting, then you would have to say the same thing on the other side. And that would make this conversation just let me know if i'm bugging out let me know if i'm bugging out but i'm gonna continue i'm press play i have to continue stopping every now and then so as not to just rip the you know this is for commentary this is for commentary but let's continue slavery but continuing through nearly a century of jim crow as well as ongoing forms of racism that are still persistent to this day uh, it is not a question of personal responsibility on the part of any individual. What distinguishes this case is the fact that slavery and Jim Crow were embedded explicitly into the legal structure in the United States and were enacted or acted upon on that basis. Uh, if there are other types of injustices that have occurred, we frequently have certain types of legal remedies for those, but there was no legal remedy for being enslaved. There was no legal remedy for being subjected to segregation or apartheid. I'm trying to the see States when a man called in. Hold on. Things that were written directly into the nation's laws. Sandy Darity of Duke University serves oh, as a public policy professor here for a conversation. Hold on, I missed on it. Where's the last caller? And this experience is one in which that there are ongoing damages that need for being justice. Oh, here we go, here we go. You for something. Racism. What? This is from North Carolina. We'll hear from Jeff on our Republican line. Hello. You're on. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Uh, I think reparations. Reparations is another division attempt. Um, at some point, we have to, you know, every single person, no matter what color they are, can go back and blame some. So wait, hold on. So Jeff, I believe, calls in, and now he's, uh, they said he's on the Republican line, uh, and he's saying now, and I'm going to come and read your comments, so feel free to leave them in the box, and we're going to come, we're going to chop it up while we're waiting for this rain to ease up, you know what I mean? So he's like, he thinks that it's division, but, and then he's going to try to, to a certain degree, absorb the guilty party of, of uh, taking responsibility. So let's continue. Let's see. Ah, no. For something, it's time to stop teaching incessantly in our public school systems about slavery. It's over a He said, this was some wild stuff because there was an article that I wanted to bring to you and I totally forgot, but he said, it's time to stop teaching. It's time to stop teaching uh, <laughs> slavery in the school system. So just to give you a little heads up, the article I'm gonna read right now is American schools can't figure out how to teach kids about slavery. And I don't know why they always call children kids, they're not goats. It says a New York teacher allegedly mocked slavery as a part of a larger problem. So this was in Vox. So I'm gonna read that after we listen to this man who says it's time to stop teaching because it was over a hundred years ago, but it's not time to stop teaching about the Revolutionary War. It's not time to stop to teaching about, you know what I'm saying, uh, Christopher Columbus, which was oh, even more longer than slavery. It's not time to stop teaching about American history and other histories, but it is time to stop teaching about slavery. That's, that's kind of weird, but ah, hold on, what am I? I pressed the wrong button, y'all. Hold up. All right. Hundred what years old? You cannot keep charging people that had nothing to do with slavery for the guilt of being slave owners. He's saying you cannot charge people who had nothing to do with slavery for the guilt 
of being slave owners. And he already, um, William Darity, Dr. William Darity already spoke to that uh, that point, but let's listen. Many white people have suffered injustice. We just have to move on. Thanks, caller. So the callers, that, that was the caller's way of saying, get over it. We just have to move on. You know, from a healing perspective, you cannot heal what you do not address. So this thought about moving on, it was tried and it didn't really work because for, for such a grave injustice, you cannot overlook it. It's, it's something on both sides. And I, as I said, somebody was speaking about um, slavery in the public sphere for going on what, three, no, three years, going on four years now. Yeah, on both sides, People don't want to speak about it. People don't want to talk about it. It still hurts to look at. It's still a squeamish topic. It still needs to be aired out. It still needs to be discussed. It still needs to be processed. Um, Digital Cinema says, I agree with what you're saying concerning the complexity of this discussion. That's why it's important for us to talk about it. I agree. It's, and I have been agreeing that this, this is important to talk about for many, 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 many reasons. Uh, concerning his thought about stop teaching about it, we did see uh, a Texas school book try to change um, change the narrative, and that went viral some years ago. I think it was forced migration. You know what I'm saying? All of these uh, sanitized words that if you if we're not careful, uh, it will come up later on in history as though it was erased. And then and then we had even within our own community, I've had to do videos on people who are saying the transatlantic slave trade didn't even exist. So there, it's not only just coming from one side; it's coming from many sides to try to make it go away. When I saw that, it particularly had me like, "What?" This was some years ago when this doctrine of, "Oh, we weren't really slaves, and it really didn't happen the way they said it happened, and it really didn't go down like that, and it really, you know, where are the ships?" Right? Where are the boats? Where are the ships? I mean, I mean, like all of these theories started to come out, and I was like, "Okay, let's go." So we're gonna talk about American schools can't figure out how to teach slavery. And again, I have covered. Anytime I see these stories, either I share them or I cover them. So from the slave auction to the slave runaway slave poster to the um, trying to make the person to, the, and, uh, or every time either the mother is offended, the parents are offended, the child is offended. So the question is, how do you approach this discussion? Because you cannot just stop talking about it. It says a white teacher at an affluent New York private school has been accused of holding a mock slave auction for her students in which white fifth graders pretend to bid on their black peers. Yes, seriously, this is a real news story in 2019 from just last week, at this point, like two weeks ago. And it's merely the latest in a long line of high profile controversies revolving around poorly conceived lessons about slavery in American schools. The latest story comes from the Chapel School in Bronxville, New York, a private school in an affluent, predominantly white neighborhood north of Manhattan. According to New York's P. IX11 News, fifth grade teacher Rebecca Anti, Antin, what is her name? It's on Antinozzi, allegedly had her black students leave the classroom and according to one student, pretended to put on imaginary trains along our necks and wrists and shackles on our ankles. The teacher then led the students back into the classroom where their white classmates were encouraged to bid on them, according to the outlet. Auntie, I'm sorry if I'm messing your name up. Auntie Ozzy reportedly pretended to be a slave auctioneer during the simulation. The classroom actively received attention after a black parent at the school complained, saying that her son was humiliated by the exercise. I'm shocked and infuriated that this happened, my mother said. The mother of Vernix Hardin told the New York Daily News. The school has launched an investigation into the incident, calling the alleged mock auction racially insensitive and hurtful. In an email to the school, anti on who oh, you said that woman your name, anti nosy has been removed from class and hired a lawyer who argues that the portrayal of history lessons that have been reported is inaccurate out and out of context and contains false facts. End quote. New York 
Attorney General Latita James says that her office is monitoring the incident. Coming just weeks after the end of particularly insulting Black History Month, marked by similar controversies in other schools, like I think I shared it here, the blackface, um, the mask poem, but that one was older. It was a mask poem that uh, all of the children wore this blackface mask to recite this poem. I think I read the poem here though. It says, uh, fits into a broader pattern of ill-conceived or outright offensive classroom simulations about slavery question. It is an offensive, controversial part of history. So while I'm reading this, I'm gonna come back and ask, how should one, no, 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 no. I am on live, take that icy pop out of this room. I see pop, I see pop out of this room. That's what they do, they hold you up. They be like, yo, you on live, give me the icy pop. Hey, Cynthia, welcome to the discussion. Y'all saw that, right? She tried to hold me up for the icy pop. And that's my icy pop, too. How y'all gonna try to eat my icy pop? Anywho, let's back this light up off again. Okay, let me go back and read. So let me know, it, it's a controversial, hurtful time in history. How does, how should, because a lot of parents are leaving the school system to teach this, first of all. A lot of people do not want to speak about it. And the second of all. And so how does the school system who mostly have European in some areas, teachers teaching your school, I mean, teaching your children. And in some cases, parents go to the extent to have their children go to better schools. So in other districts that are predominantly European so that they can get a better education. So question is, how should these people who are providing the education for your children share this part in history? Or should they do as the caller said and no longer talk about it? And what are the implications of that staring down the reparations 2020 bar, you know, conversation where this whole discussion is about studying the impacts of it and then compensating for it? Question. I'm gonna go back and continue to read here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's continue to read, let's continue to read. Yeah, did you see that? They ran up on me like, hey, I'm like, you better get up off me, little child. Okay. Uh, we gotta, it's, the rain is easing up, so I'm going I'm to go outside in a minute. going to go outside in a minute. Okay, let me go back. Okay, continuing. Breathe. Coming just weeks after the end of the popular, pop, particularly insulting, I read that already. Boom, 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 boom. Um... The story of the alleged classroom mock auction fits into a broader, okay, I already read that. Collectively, these incidents reveal just how bad American schools still are at educating students about slavery and how it has shaped American history. Question, this was the reality. Mo auctions were the reality. That was actually what happened. How do you teach it? But then if I'm gonna be just and fair talking about if then, if the same school teaches about the Holocaust, are, do they bring um, European Jewish descendants to play the role of the Holocaust victim? And do they allow for the um, other children to dress up as German Nazis? Like, are they modeling that? If they're going to be going over that part in history, like, do you reenact re everything in history or do you just reenact this? Because if you just reenact this, then it will look like you are just, you are just singling out the slavery narrative to uh, subjugate children who are descendants of, of enslaved individuals. You know what I mean? So that's also a question. Do you, when you're talking about, uh, the, when Europe is always doing certain things, if you're going over world history, do you play out those same things or do you just read from the book? It says that's a problem and not just because students aren't getting an adequate education. Poor lessons about slavery in schools also make it harder for people to see how the impacts of enslavement continue to affect black communities in the present. I personally, see, I like to take everything and make it for the good. And somebody asked me, our brother Baruti asked me the other day, Amuna, what are your personal thoughts? 
I usually don't give my personal, personal thoughts, but I would say for those who are gathering data for the current day emotional, like, you know how they say the person is suing for emotional, what do they call it again? Emotional pain and suffering, okay? This, these incidents, these articles over the last decade, really, I see a lot of them popping up, are proof positive, okay? These are, these are, these, these are case studies. You can use these things as case studies. These are real today, tangible things, talking about students in school systems, and it didn't just happen one time, that one could use in your discussion. This is invaluable information here. If we look at it like that, if we look at it like, oh, this is just happening again, then we totally miss the opportunity to be like, boom, wow, we got 20 incidents in the last year. Let's take a look at that because the data is already here. Hold on one second. I need to go, go on some babies and say hello to them real quick. I'll be back. All right, all right. Let's get to this article here. There have been plenty of examples of high. Hear what it? What them say? There have been plenty. Collect them. Collect them. Put them in your folder. Okay, because this joint has to be split up. I know it's. And we, somebody wants to just like do it like all in the air. I'm just gonna put all. The, some things are civil suits. Some things are criminal suits. Do you understand what I'm saying? When, just for instance, in the case of, I haven't, in the case of the R. Kelly discussion, the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, ex-wife hit with the child support, that's civil matter. So when they asked the other lawyer, the criminal lawyer about his civil matter, he says, I don't know about that. That's a civil matter. That's a separate matter. You see what I'm saying? So I'm not a lawyer, but there seems to be a lot of separate pieces here that need to be addressed so that the muddy of the waters don't take place. But anyway, put it in a folder. Put it in a folder. Y'all like it. Put it in a folder. But let me continue. It says, there have been plenty of examples of highly questionable lessons about slavery in schools. As the New York story was unfolding, did you see what happened? As soon as this happened, the, the teacher got lawyered up. Why is the teacher getting lawyered up? Question. As the New York story was unfolding, an elementary school in Wilmington, North Carolina, was making headlines for having students play a monopoly-like role playing games called Escaping Slavery to teach students about the Underground Railroad. The grandparent of a, again, unprocessed trauma, unprocessed trauma. The grandparent of a black student at the school argued that the game was offensive. Slavery was offensive. Having to run away for your freedom was a real thing. By the way, I got a book. I didn't, I didn't read my book yet, y'all. Hold on. Well, either you're going to educate the children or you're going to leave someone else to educate the children. We, we can't have it both ways, man. This is on my list. Next is the Black Panther Party. I'm almost finished the other one. When I get some of this stuff, I just be putting it down. And see there, this one was um, Bound for the Promised Land, Kate Clifford Lawson, Harriet Tubman Portrait of an American Hero. Right? Can I show y'all who Kate? So this is, this is, she went in on this research, okay? Can I tell you who Kate Clifford Lawson is? A European. Yeah, about that. How many people heard about this book? Harriet Tubman, Portrait of an American Hero. The woman who digged up um, all of the info. You have people, just like the other day I shared about Cali House and um, the professor, you know, this becomes their passion project. I have you know that a lot of people who've taken up like the Cali House conversation, even um, incidents in the life of a slave girl. When I looked at the history of who took up 
to find out because the way the book was initially written and during the time in which the book was written by Harriet Jacobs, it was written um, under a pen name. And sometimes when during that time, you could not uh, publish a book and it was like very, it was a very, what's the word I'm looking for? Dangerous time to come forward. And so the way in which she wrote the book was historical fiction. And a woman in present time, I forgot her name, her name escapes me. She, this became her passion project. And then she went to the places, she interviewed people. She did all these things to bring back the story of Harriet Jacobs. She told, she went to substantiate because she changed, you know how they say some of the names in this story have been changed to protect the, she went through all of that to dig up. Let me go get that one to dig. I'm going to give you her name right now. So, I'll, so either we're going to educate the children or you're going to leave someone else to educate, but you cannot choose not to educate the children and then get mad at every attempt that someone else makes. Hold on one second. I'm going to tell you her name. This is, I read this, this is one of my Jeezy's, Harriet Jacobs, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Um, what's the name of the, I'm, what's the name of the lady? She, hold on, one second. Y'all know when I freestyle, man, it, 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 it's just so many stuff in my head, just start popping out all over it. The woman, what's the name, Harriet Jacobs? Yo, I'm sorry, yo, my Google keywords be crazy. Mm. 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 Oh. And, and when you look at the lady on face, she looks European. Wait a minute. Hold on. And it takes a lot to excavate people's um, stories. It sometimes it takes years to do so. Oh, what's her name? What's her name? Hold on. Aha, here she is. Ah, go oh, Mona. Her name is Dr. Jean Fagan Yellen. Uh, th this is her right here. This is her. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going to give you some stuff right now. I'm going to let you let her hear you so you can see for yourself. Hold on. Okay, so we're done with this one. This I don't agree with him. We shouldn't stop teaching it, but we should be taking more personal responsibility for teaching it because it's healing. And in order to do so, in order to teach it to the children, you have to know it yourself and be able to process it so that they can teach it to those who come after them. Okay, here we go. Let me show you her. Dr. Jean Fagan Yellen. Today we're going to have a conversation with Dr. Jean Fagan Yellen, and we're going to learn about two remarkable women who live more than a century apart. Oh, come on now. Come on now. The first is Harriet Jacobs, who wrote the first female slave narrative in which she explained her escape from sexual oppression, her escape from slavery. And we're going to learn about Dr. Jean Fagan Yellen, who spent years of her life, more than a century later, to prove that this work was indeed not a work of fiction, was not written by white abolitionists, but by a woman who was determined to be free. She was from Eaton, North Carolina, and we're here to learn more about her. Harriet Jacobs was my hero. She was born here in Eatonton in 1813, born into slavery. She managed to escape from slavery. She was a fugitive in the South. She was a fugitive in the North. After her freedom was bought, she wrote a book about her life, and she published it just, just before the Civil War was started. She was six years old before she knew that she was held in slavery. She was the pet of her mother and father. She was the darling. Well, I gotta just mother. stop it intermittently. So this is the woman who spent years of her life because they wrote this book off because a lot of books were coming out 
they wrote this book off as being um, not a real life story. So her mission, she took up the mission to get this book validated that it is not just, uh, it's not historical fiction, it's an autobiography. Let me continue. Uh, she was just cherished by uncles and aunts all around her. She had an extended family here in Ableton. And she did not know that she was as threatened until she was six years old when her mother died. And then she was very fortunate. She had a kind young mistress. So I'll put the link in the box if you want to read more about Dr. Jean Fagan yelling. So when I read this book a couple of years ago, I wanted to learn more about it. So, you know, we just did the research and was like, oh, okay. So you have to. It's the same when, like Cali House. I have to get that book. That one is on my list as well. But, um, you know, these are the things. If you want to educate the children, um, there's an intellectual education. And I think why, and I'll go back to the article, why we're experiencing some of what we're experiencing with the art, with, with the physical, with the physical reenactments is because that is activating another part of the soul to actually know it in your mind is one thing, but to feel it or to be made to make, to go through these motions are another thing. And it's actually, and in these young children, these, these parts of suffering and the, this embarrassment and shame and things that they're feeling is within them, right? These are the things that epigenetically can be passed down based on what our foreparents experience. So question is how will what are what is the course of action to begin to flush these things out? How do you get toxins outside of the body? Should the European be the one who is facilitating these discussions, or should they not? There was a, a part that um, and I'll continue, but y'all got this book. Get this book, man. Get this book, right? Because it got some interwestern stuffs in here. I want to read something that that oh boy Thomas Jefferson said concerning concerning what slavery does and then I'll continue reading let me do the old lady hum while I find it Come on, see this is off the this is off the cuff so if i don't find it i might have to come back just as i was about to say i couldn't find it boop i found it okay i found it this is out of uh thomas jefferson notes on the state of virginia right this is in um man they got my roman numeral this is query number 18 Okay, the particular customs and manners that may happen to be received in that state. He says this, I'm gonna jump down. The whole commerce or exchange between master and slave is a perpetual exercise of the most boisterous passions, the most unremitting despotism on one part, and degrading submission on the other. Our children see this, talking about the European children, and learn to imitate it, for man is an imitative animal. So if the children are seeing this and receiving this, he's talking about them, and passing down, so now they have shame. This is why you heard the man come on later and say, trying to shame Europeans because now they have shame and now they have guilt and now we have what is called a level of white fragility. That's also a book that was written as well. That's an interesting study to check out, right? So this is all things, they, they, they inherited something as well. This let's dismiss it, let's let it go away, let's not take any personal responsibility. It's called white fragility. And according to Thomas Jefferson, he's saying that this witnessing slavery also not only damaged the, old, the person who was forced, who was degraded into submission, it stole the soul of the person who was abusing, okay? I jump over to the next page. With the morals of the people, their industry also is destroyed. 
So he's telling you, he's already doing the reparation study. He's telling you what's being destroyed. The morals, industry. He says, for in warm climate, no man will labor for himself who can make another labor for him. Admission of guilt. This is so true that of the proprietors of slave, slaves, a very small portion indeed are ever seen to labor. I can go on, but let me jump down lastly to another thing that I had highlighted at a previous time. The spirit of the master abating that of the slave rising from the dust, his condition mollifying the way I hope preparing on the auspices of heaven to for a total emancipation, and that is disposed in order of events to be with the consent of master rather than by their extirpation. Very interesting. We'll have to come back and talk about it at another time. I'm going to read your comments, so continue to leave, leave them. I'm going to jump back to educating your own children um, and allowing for spaces of which this trauma to, can leave the body so that it's we the people are not so reactive. It says, uh, okay, boom. The grant I'm reading for those who just joined us, I, I started off with the William Darry discussion. So if you missed it and you just joined us and you're like, she's not talking about that, I spoke about it in the beginning. So when we're done with this live, you can go back and check it out. But right now we're look, we're addressing the comment that the caller made at the end of the narrative or of the call. And he's talking about that that America should stop teaching about slavery in the school systems. So again, I'm reading an article titled, American schools can't figure out how to teach kids about slavery. So now I am at the part where they played slave monopoly. The grandparent of a black student of the school argued that the game was offensing, offensive, noting that it included cartoon images of shackles and enslaved families. One part of the game required students to use a free punch card if your group runs into trouble four times, you'll be severely punished and sent back to the plantation to work as a slave, the card said. A few weeks before that, a school in London County, Virginia, was criticized for having students run an obstacle course intended to simulate moving through the Underground Railroad. The school said that the lessons were intended to teach teamwork and communication, adding that students were not explicitly told to think of themselves as enslaved people during the activity. Again, like I said, if we look at slavery as a domestic violence institution, then someone would be appalled if someone was asked to uh, reenact being abused or reenact to a certain degree being raped. They may look for the verbiage, hold on, where this is a level of role play, but if someone was in that situation, they would also uh, be appalled. It says a few weeks before that a school in Lauding County, Virginia was, I read that already? Hold up, I already read that already. It says the, the Lauding NAACP on the other hand argued that even without the instruction, the intent of the game was obvious. Given that the Underground Railroad was used to help enslaved people escape to the North, the majority of students going through the obstacle course would clearly be role playing as enslaved people. And usually when you role play, that's what came to my mind. So stay right here one second. I'm almost at the end of the article. I saw this book. I saw this book in my studies and I didn't get to finish reading it, but it's definitely on my list. Talking about role playing and healing collective trauma, right? So there's information about, again, for those who just join me, I am not coming from at this conversation from a political aspect. I never have. I focus on trauma and I focus on healing, okay? So this is why I find it in, uh, very important for us to know the history. I find it very important for us to go through our own individual cleansing as well as collective cleansing. So this book, Healing Collective Trauma, using social drama and drama therapy. Very interesting book as I began to read it. So some of what we are seeing, the visceral reaction from the students indicates that there is trauma in that area. So instead of the teachers just maybe just piecing together things that they think may be cool, there may need to be people 
who become more aware of healing collective trauma. There may be something that needs to go into the school systems that talk about acknowledging. It's like if some if a child is abused at home. Can, can y'all still hear me? Let me know if y'all can still hear me. Because on my side, it's just uh, circling. If, some, if a child is abused at home, the school psychologist will be aware that that child is abused. And so when the teacher is reporting on the behavior of the child, they're aware of this thing, right? And so when you talk about melanated children in school, it's all oh, their misbehavior and they're not sitting down, they have ADD, they have this and that. That may not be the case. The lens by which you're looking at the discussion has to go towards not special, special needs, but acknowledging that they may be having more on their, oh, thank you, Cynthia on their plate than others and being educated in stuff like healing collective trauma. Unfortunately, the teacher, not unfortunately, but the children, the teachers are going to have to be up for more than just teaching because you're, you're, you're dealing with souls on a daily basis that come with a lot of baggage that was inherited by the situation that we are. So this is an interesting book. I got it off of Amazon, Amazon and it talks about actively going through kind of what you see, um, in some spaces, Iyana is doing with this uh, Fix My Life discussion. So this is a book that came to my mind, but I'll continue for the sake of time. But now I'm running down. Ah, oh, man, now I'm running down. All right, hopefully I'll get through the rest of this. At last in month in South Carolina, a Black mother complained after she learned that her son went to school field trip where students picked cotton while singing songs, arguing that the activity was inappropriate. So far, we got inappropriate. We got controversial. We got different words that that are accurate because all of those things is what slavery was. Okay, the boys' school district apologized, but instructors at the trip site countered that students were learning about the Great Depression, adding that students have been taken on the trip for nearly fifteen years, and that the trip site is an old school run by black instructors. So they're like melanated instructors took them there and. And the parents are still upset and offended. So do they agree with the man that this shouldn't be taught? It says, there are just a few examples. These are just, sorry, a few examples, but there are many, many, many. A lot of students are struggling. Uh, Mona, a lot of states are struggling to teach the full history of slavery. That struggle is having a big impact on students. I will agree. We did not learn about this sufficiently in school. Therefore, you cannot process it. Therefore, we cannot have or we are not having informed conversations. And therefore, we're still susceptible to being manipulated by people who may have other ulterior motives because we are emotionally vulnerable. It says social media posts from angered black parents and civil rights groups have brought a number of these incidents to light in recent years. But it's unclear how widespread these sorts of activities are. What is clear, though, is that these simulations fit into a larger set of difficulties school systems across America have when it comes to teaching about slavery and connecting the past to current fights for racial justice. In 2018, a report by the Southern Poverty Law Center took a comprehensive look at this issue. Researchers surveyed students and teachers across the country, reviewing popular textbooks, and looked at state standards on education about slavery and what they found was disturbing so y'all ready for what they found and i didn't even click on that report so i might have to come back and get into the report <laughs> let's finish this article the report found that out of 1,000 high school seniors polled just eight percent identified slavery as the reason the south seceded from the union sparking the civil war 48% said the tax protests were the cause of the conflict. The researchers noted that it was possible that the students were confusing the Civil War with the Revolutionary War. Researchers also discovered that of the 15 states whose educational standards they examined, none, how the, none addressed how the ideology of white supremacy rose to justify the institution of slavery, end quote. And that quote, most fail to lay out meaningful requirements for learning about slavery and the lives of millions of enslaved people or about how their labor was essential to the American economy. The Southern Poverty Law Center report was 
specifically critical of the use of simulations in the classroom, which we're just reading about, arguing that they are, quote, not shown to be effective as a learning strategy. They may not be effective as a learning strategy, but they may be effective as a healing strategy, especially if you switch the narrative, if you turn it around, if you turn it on its head, usually in an abusive situation and they do role play, the role play is not to be yourself, the role play is to take the role of the other party. So the switching would be, which would even be more offensive to many, the switching would be uh, in this role play, like if you have a husband and wife and they say, or oh, tell me you be the wife and you be the husband and reenact that. Reenact what the other person looks to you, right? The role play would be reenacting, switching the roles of master and slave, and then reenacting how that person would look to you. It says, um, the report noted that simulations can harm vulnerable children and the trauma of such lesson is compounded for black students. Although we teach them that slavery happened, we fail to provide the detail or historical context they need to make sense of its origin, evolution, demise, and legacy. Hence the reason why I thought it was so important to do the lead child project plug, right? Because we were learning, a lot of people on social media are learning about slavery from memes. It says, Ohio State University historian Hassan Kwame Jeffries wrote in the report, and in some cases, we minimize slavery's, it doesn't say minimalizing, minimize slavery's significance so much that we render its impact on people and on the nation inconsequential. For those who just joined us, welcome to discussion. You can hear me fine. That's what's up. I'm going to come and read your comments in a minute. I'm at the end of the article trying not to deviate anymore. I have two more paragraphs, y'all. As a result, high school graduates are left with a flawed and incomplete understanding of slavery and its legacy. The legalized discrimination and racial disparities that continue to impact the black community to this day. Quote, it's clear that the United States is struggling with how to talk about the history of slavery and its aftermath, end quote. The researchers noted, and as controversies over lessons like the mock auction in New York and other problematic lessons from recent weeks show, this struggle is having a real effect on black students and their parents. I will put this article in the box. Sorry for misreading. Again, 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 again. This report, as well as just observation, shows that we are, we as a collective, the people as a collective who went to grade school or high school or, or, or sometimes college, even if you didn't go and take Africana studies, I would say college too, do not learn. If you don't take a vested interest in this area to get accurate information, you are not being taught. And I've said this before that the extent of the ex-education are from slave movies like Roots, like Amistad, okay? From I would just say from slave movies. That is the extent of the education. and because it's so hard to watch many people i remember when the underground series came out and i covered underground i don't want to see i'm so tired i have slave fatigue slave fatigue again so studying trauma has to be in conjunction with studying about healing but you cannot know what to address and what to heal if you have not studied the trauma this is why people say Oh, it, is, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter, it's not important to study. It is important to study or else you're gonna be grasping at straws. When you someone goes to the doctor with an ailment, they don't just jump up and be like, yeah. They'll be like, okay, we're gonna take these diagnostic tests. We're gonna evaluate you. If it's really bad, we're gonna retain you. And then we're gonna see what's going on with you. And then they tell you to be patient because they're a doctor. And then they begin tinkering around. If this that has not been done, you cannot compare this traumatic experience of the transatlantic slave trade to anything else is incomparable. Nothing except for the trans-Saharan slave trade, which has its own set of things that went not west, but east, right? So I'm gonna come and read, uh, whew, hold on, let me take some sip of water. Like people be drinking their tea and stuff. I'm over here like, hold up. This conversation gets me turned up. I don't, I don't know, it just gets me turned up. I'm gonna tell y'all a wild story and I'm gonna come to um now I ain't gonna tell no wild story. Let me come to y'all comments real quick. 
Do, 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 do. Okay, Cynthia says, shout out Cynthia. I was fortunate that in, in that we were taught at home and we received respectful teachings at school, neighborhood schools from a diverse community in the early 70s. So, so thank you, Cynthia. Cynthia sharing her experience that she was taught at home. Many children are not. I'm gonna come back at another time and read that Southern Poverty Law Center uh, article um, to see the extent of what children know about what actually happened during slavery. But thank you for that. Yeah, what's up says it may be painful in many facets for all parties injured, offender, perpetrator, violator, victim. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's so intertwined and intertangled. It's crazy. There was a um, I think there was a documentary on the DeWolf family. The DeWolf family was one of the richest slave trading families in the North. You could look it up. And they took the journey to, and it, they did a documentary on it. Now I gotta tell you what the name of the documentary is because I just be mentioning stuffs. And if I don't tell you, you're gonna be like, I don't know what the name of the documentary is. The Wolf family documentary. Faces of the Trade, that's the name of it. it they gave a little bit of information on the uh, PBS, but it came out some years ago where they retraced their steps and you might walk past them in the street and may not know that they're the descendants of who you're talking about. They're the descendants of the people who you need to like, write their name on some stuff, but they went through tracing the history and legacy of slavery and their family's connection with it. How many people heard about the DeWolf family? I'm gonna just drop it in the box. I'm gonna just drop it in the box and I'm gonna keep reading. This is the DeWolf family right here. Uh, uh, here's the article. I, here's the Harriet Jacobs, and I'll put it in the box below too. But since I didn't put it in the box, and that some of this stuff is just off the top of my head, this is the article on the woman who searched down the history of um, Harriet Jacobs to get her respected. They had to put some respect on her name. You know what I'm saying? Put some respect on her name. So that's the woman, um, Dr. Jean Fagan yelling. She was yelling. She was like, yo, put some respect on her name. And then you have uh, the article from Vox that I just read, and that is right here. You get receipts when you come through the, through the uh, what they call it, Solanomics, Lev Project, what they call it, right? You get receipts. They like receipts. We like these type of receipts. But let's continue. Uh, King Wasset says, what white immigrants, American, and their descendants will argue that they should not have to pay reparations for the same reason that ADOs argue immigrants should not receive representation. Yeah, we spoke about that earlier. We did the whole if then statement. Um, uh, you probably came in later, but uh, yeah, that's the discussion that was, I played uh, the clip from William Darity and I kind of did that whole role play thing. So definitely that's gonna be the argument and that's something we have to take a look at. Um, if it's, if it's, if then, if it's being said on one side, then we have to look at if it's applicable on the other side. But according to William Darity, he says that they are experiencing the fruits of the tree which I find interesting because on the other side, it's not being said that that same, that same sentiment, that same sentiment is not being conveyed, but we'll continue. Each may suffer chronic forms of delusional denial. Yes, these are all, what we'll have is the grieving process. We go, I went through that again before, I'll go through it again. Each might benefit from restorative mechanisms, truth and records. Man, yeah, that's what's up. That's why your name is, yeah, that's what's up because that's what's up, what you're saying is true. Each side needs to be dealt with to shed the shame, embarrassment, guilt, and allowing pursuit of holistic ob objective healing. Yeah, that's what's up. Yeah, that's what's up. I just have to keep saying, yeah, that's what's up because you're saying what's up. That's what I am saying, that each has to go through their own uh, journey to deal with that. When you see, um, there was a, a doctor, <sighs> psychologist, who speaks about what Europeans, some see when they see the melanated body specifically the male melanated body. What they see and sometimes they say some, I have to go back and get that. I, I can't keep, I, I gotta get that source. How about I just leave that source? Cause now I don't have to go stop and go get that source. So I'm not even gonna bring that up right now. Um, Teresa, you can hear me? Cool, that's what's up. Um, LF says, I agree with you that teachers need more commitment to change their teaching strategies. I think if curriculum was adjusted and teachers were compensated better, you may be able to attract more qualified teachers. Maybe not just, yeah, yeah. 
The teachers are like, Psh, I'm here. I don't even want to be here. You ain't even paying me for this. You, you never know what's going on. There was a teacher the other day. What did she do? Oh, that was a teacher. No, she worked at the school system. I, I did cover that story. She worked at the cool school system and she cursed out the um the man at the uh in Connecticut. It was what East Haven. She cursed him out and called him a ninja and all this type of stuff and spit on the ground and stuff like this. So you don't really even know, first of all, who the teacher is. And even if they're not uh, doing it willfully and maliciously, how do you approach such a sensitive topic? Question. Sister question says, this is the reason why we need to keep teaching our children about the injustices that our people had in this land and in our country. Yes. 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 Hold on one second, y'all. That's one of the children. I'm going to tell you my daughter's response to when I, I, I informed Yep, yep, sorry about that. The babies is like, lady, it's time to go. It stopped raining. Okay, Um. yes, uh, this is the reason why we need, shout out to Sister Queen, this is the reason why we need to keep teaching our children about the injustice that our people had in this land and other countries, I agree. And if we don't, we become complacent in our situation, which is worst thing we can do. I agree, all of this outrage, I would have to ask the parents because I talk about personal responsibility. How much do you educate your children about what has happened? Like I get, I get age appropriate books. So I don't get, I don't give like my young, my oldest daughter, I don't give her like, you know, I get their age appropriate books. I'm not going to go get it now, but they're age appropriate books and age appropriate discussions that can be had so that they can understand what happened, what's happening and why it's happening. And as they grow, then you, Kind of give them more information, not just about slavery, but I, I teach them a, a vast amount of things about what's happening in the world, nature of people, you know what I'm saying? Uh, economics. These are the responsibilities of those at home so that when you, your child goes to school, if they go to school, or if, if, they, if, if you homeschool them, is different. If they go to school, then you have to be, they have to be aware, like, wait a minute, that's not correct. You understand? But if they don't have any information to push back on what is being given to them, because the parent is not, or the parents or the family is not on their job, then that's low tove, as they say. That's not good. Okay, Cynthia says, it's almost difficult to come up with a solution because our people are so traumatized that it's hard for us to initiate the healing. I would say initiating the healing is, I remember starting this left project and I can go back and give some testimonies that I've gotten over the left project. I mean, people were kicking, screaming, you know, I don't want to see this. I don't want to talk about it. At first it started off like, yay. And then as I went along, I couldn't get a reader for nothing. So I read. And what it did for me was allow for these feelings and, and, and emotions to begin to find passage and way to where I can look at it. I was telling a friend the other day that for me, this discussion, how you get to the other side and just, because I like to share from personal experience. At first, if somebody wants to go to school to become a doctor, like this is your life. Believe in, welcome, everybody welcome who's just joined us. This is your life, okay? This is the experience. This is something you want to get compensated for. This is something you want to be acknowledged for, okay? This is something that spans back hundreds of years. So it will behoove the individuals to actually be vested into it. If you want to inherit your grandfather's fortune or your grandmother's fortune or your great grandmother's fortune, wouldn't you want to care about what they did and their story and their narrative, how they acquired it, what they did, the blood, sweat, and tears, everything that went into it? Because without those things, then you will not value what you're about to get. And so I found in this journey, just for, from a healing perspective, having these discussions starts with just hearing their words. I read both sides of the narrative because you, because you have to understand the oppressed and the oppressor. 
I know it's difficult. What that does is raises the emotional intelligence, not just intellectually, to look at what one was seeing it as and what the other one was seeing it as. And when you talk about why both sides of the conversation are going like this, because they came at it from two different things. Again, when your parent was your parent when you were a child, your parent was dealing with different level of things than you were. You were responding to your parent based on what you saw as a child. And your, your parent is responding to you based on all of the other pressures and things that were involved that you may not be privy to. So the parent-child relationship paradigm um, is how slavery, the institution was set up an abusive parent child exploitive relationship call them your foster child parents call them the adoptive parents call the system and institution whatever you want but you were the our four parents kidnapped okay crime okay people were buying stolen goods another crime but once they had possession of stolen goods which are people they then gave themselves the rights to the, that's a whole nother discussion, but I'm just giving you a little highlight of how I begin to look at this in the lens from which is like, you're trying to solve a cold case crime, man. And you're like, how do, how, how do I understand what it is that I'm looking at? Maybe I'm looking at it wrong. You know what I mean? But again, I'll come back and talk about that. Digital cinema system. Mona, what are your thoughts on the brown, blue eye, brown eye experiment performed by Jane Elliott? That exactly, exactly, exactly. That would have be an experiment in this healing collective trauma. If you don't know about, thank you for that digital cinema. If you don't know about um, Jane Elliott, check her out. But that would be an experiment. What she did is what I'm talking about. What the teachers are doing are letting the same people who represent the perpetrators and the same people who represent the oppressed and Jane Elliott flips it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So check out, I agree. I think it was, she's been doing that experiment, if I'm not mistaken, six to six feet. And some of these responses, I mean, visceral. You know, some of the responses, like I remember I watched one of them and the, the European girl, she just up and quit. But then you also see when you give certain people these unearned privileges, you see the ego, which in my estimation, the ego transcends color. The ego is a human condition. You see the ego begin to act out some of the very same things that one thinks it's only attributed to a color. But that's another, that's a deep, we might go over that one because that's, uh, that's also very interesting. Um, I thought that was an interesting experiment. So definitely check that experiment out. Sister, the question says, LF, that's why I homeschool my kids. I think that our people should teach our own children. The Torah states that we should teach our children, not send them to another. We have a great responsibility for educating our children. And LF says it is difficult, and that's true. This, this is the economic uh, setback for many to say, I would love to do that, but I don't have the opportunity to do it for all of these other economic reasons. It says they haven't prepared for families, so sometimes parents are dead tired trying to financially play catch up with the parent and spouse. This is also true. And Teresa says, I think it's essential that our children are taught about the cruelty of Europeans in order for history not to repeat itself. Role play gives our children the emotional pain our ancestors felt. And I, I would say about the emotional pain I've said it before, a lot of times this pain became stuck. It didn't, because it kept repeating, repeating, repeating. And so the passage of this pain, not to say to become numb to what we're seeing, but many people don't even want to look at it. When I've read some of these books, I've had to step away for months because I would wake up upset. <laughs> you understand? One in particular, I, I think I've shown you her before, but one in particular, she was supposedly, Ann Kimball is her name. She over there. She over there. You know how Bernie Mac say him over there? She over there. The way in which, see, the, this is the European man, right? And then you have different parts of the, and Thomas Jefferson was kind of, he was kind of, I guess because they thought he wasn't reading. 
he was kind of like transparent with some of the stuff we're saying. He's the one of the ones who brought up that um, melanated people are uh, designed differently and their sweat glands are different and they don't need as much sleep as others. We'll come back and talk about that. That formed a lot of the thoughts um, that people had because someone was different. But I say that to say, when you read different people's perspective, it gives you, like I said, in the non-PC world, this was before political correctness, you were able to get the fullness of what someone thought about you and where these ideas were being formed and how they influenced the culture and by extension, how they influenced this treatment, right? And so these are all, I know it's a lot and people might be like, I ain't no got nobody no time for that. Just cut the check. Even if they cut the check, still going to have to process it. Why? Because it still affects today how one person deals with another. I watched the show for research purposes. It was on YouTube. It is called um, How I Blew a Bag. Has anybody seen that? Like a, um, It's not a documentary. It's like a a blog kind of vlog kind of show, how I how I blew a bag or something or uh, something like to that effect. Now I gotta go look at the name of the show. So if you haven't noticed by now, I don't like giving any accurate information. So if I'm wrong on something, I like to go pull it up real quick before it goes on and then somebody repeats it and then I was wrong. So I don't like to give inaccurate information. Okay, so the name of the show is. Blew a bag. I guess it came, comes on BET. Blew a bag is the name of the show. And, you, and and I find these things very interesting. I watch like um, information about lottery winners and the way in which they go broke. Because it's not enough to just know how to do something. You also have to understand what happens when someone blew, do something and then how they get to the position that they're in. So the name of this particular show is Blew a Bag. And it goes over the people reflecting on their experiences when they say cut the check and get the bag. Now you have people in uh, in these positions to get the bag and they tell you how quickly they blew the bag. So while it's important for people to be running around talking about get the bag or cut the check, it's also important for people to be talking about how do you maintain that? How do you responsibly deal with that? If you have emotional injuries, if you have low self-esteem, let's just say hypothetically someone gets a bag, okay? If you are still in a space where you have low self-esteem or communication issues, relationship issues, family issues, in this not only social media, Instagram model world where perception is everything, one may invest their monies into vanity so that they can get the respect or adoration or attention that they're looking for from others. One person comes to mind and I think she came on and I didn't know that she did other things, but I just saw the report of her on the Iyanla show wanting to take out these injections that now are, are life-threatening. What's her name again? I believe her name is Kay Michelle. I believe her name is Kay Michelle where she wanted, what didn't, um, wasn't satisfied with the body where she was given and wanted to go into where she would uh, fit into, I guess, I don't know, this social acceptance of having a big behind. And so she gets these injections that are now uh, causing all manner of illness within her body, right? So you get access to money, to a bag, to a check. And then if things are not right, you blow the bag, you blow the opportunity. So one per it's not everybody does not have to be talking about the same thing. They're, this is how you put puzzles and pieces together, where you get the piece that you have that you've been working on, and you put your piece on the table so that it may not be important at the beginning. But that one that you ever had a puzzle that's missing that one piece, it's like none of the puzzle is put together. So anyway, I'm I'm a wind up. <laughs> Ella says, I agree with you. People are not prepared to still make important history. Gives us a mind, set us. Education gives us the mind, set us these people. Ella is saying, sacrifice TV and phone. I agree. 
Sacrifice the TV and the phone. Sacrifice, sacrifice the big screen TV that people run for Black Friday on. I'm gonna come back and talk about this uh this uh scramble. I was rereading it the other day. I forgot I was looking for something, and I'm gonna reread this conversation about, and I'm gonna uh juxtapose Black Friday and this 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 uh narrative that was given by a um a slave trader about the ways in which on some of the islands they would go in and uh, procure, as they put it, these uh, melanated bodies. Digital Cinema says, I'm married and my husband and I don't have children yet. Do you have any suggestions or resources to educate ourselves? And when is it appropriate to teach children touchy subject matter? Yes. I'm the touchy subject matter mommy, right? Only because my father is a touchy subject matter so when we were little and my mother would ask my father to, to, to help us with the homework, that's when we got the real to real, right? And I remember as a child, like, Ooh, you know what I mean? But it shaped me and molded me into the type of person I am today. So I do it gradually because you don't want to like run a child off and a child goes off hollering. So I'm, I, because light, if you turn on light and it floods the person, it can blind them. And you can have the reverse effect of what you are desiring. So children are usually, if you establish a good rapport with them and you're willing to communicate with them, which I do, like even before my children could speak, I would sit there having, you know, full conversations with them. I remember my brother would be like, well, who are you talking to? I'm like the baby. They understand. So that when they begin to speak, they're not Google gaga in you, right? They're trying to form these thoughts. So you engage with the child. What I experienced. Um, and I'm a mother, I mean, one many times over, is that, for instance, not just uh, touching magic, such as, I would say, trash and litter, okay? So, pollution, um, the effects of whatever they may have a question of, mommy, can I have this? Mommy, can I have that? My, my thing is, let me tell you about too much sugar intake. For instance, and they will say, well, wh why, why can I have all these things in, uh, in the store? So we don't, we, I teach them to read labels. So down to my five-year-old, she reads labels. Okay. And then I will say to them, you know, you see this. So you educate them. Every little thing you have is an opportunity. It doesn't have to be like a lot of 50 million books. You just say, Hey, take a look at this. Take a look at the sugar content. Take a look at these uh, additives and preservatives. This is not good. But then I have personally done this. I show them, uh, child appropriate documentaries. So they have a documentary about childhood obesity. They have a documentary about fast food babies, right? And so I would sit there and give them as much as they can be about uh, babies whose parents introduced them to junk food too early and the effects that it has. And so now they have more, because minds are like libraries. You have to have books and resources to pull from or else you're gonna start making up fiction. I watch that with children. If they don't have some real time stuff to pull from, all of a sudden that story gonna get fictionized real quick. And so little by little, I take each opportunity to, you drive in the car, you talk to them. You see what their eyes go towards. I remember my daughter was really young and her eye, there was a girl, uh, did she have a weave or, or was it a European? I think it was a European girl. And children are naturally inquisitive. She's looking, and the girl is like doing like this, you know. And my daughter is like entranced, like, what in the world? So I'm observing and I'm watching it, and I'm like, yo, you know, you want to talk about it? <laughs> and I look crazy. I'm seeing myself in the um, <laughs> in the YouTube doing how the little girls doing. And so I took that opportunity to speak to my daughter about what you're noticing with other people's hair and how it behaves as opposed to your hair and um, the differences and the similarities and the beauty of what you have been given and begin to appreciate what you have been given. And these conversations will lead to the bigger conversations. I say that to say the bigger conversations that along the way, children will just ask wild things like, well, why is such and such? You'll be listening to a news report or you'll read a book or, and they'll just ask you a question. And then you, you give it in a way that they can understand. This is why I speak a lot in analogies. You know what I'm saying? I speak, I try to take scenarios and principles from scenarios to try to illustrate my point so that I can even communicate to that child. And then as they grow older, 
like my daughter, I uh, they have historical fictions for a little bit older, you know what I'm saying? Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, they're like that. They have historical fictions where I give her an historical fiction, um, a historical fiction book to read about that time period. I also, she, there's a series, if I call her now, she's gonna tell me the um, name of the series. There's a series that talks about, and it's done in children's form. See, let me, let me give y'all one more thing. Hold on, let me go ask her the name of the series. Hold on one second, I'll be back. And then I'm gonna log off y'all. Any questions or comments, feel free to leave it in the box. I'll be right back. Let me go ask her the name of the series. Okay, I'm back. I got one more source for you guys. I come with receipts, y'all. I come with receipts. I come with receipts. Um, it's the who was, what was, and um, where was Sims. So I started, I got smarter, but I was I was buying all of these before. And then it has like, these are for children. What was the Underground Railroad, right? And they kind of break it down. So it's a jumping, a jumping off, starting off point. Uh, who was Sojourner Truth, right? And the series, it's it's for children, you know what I mean? And then she has questions, and then we go from there. Who was Rosa Parks? And they have all of these. Who was Amadar's maze? You know, who was Tiger Woods? Who was Tiger Woods? Who was Barack Obama? It, it's a lot in this series. Who was Do Dr. Martin Luther King? You know what I mean? And so these are just a few of the books. She loves reading. You know, they love reading. And so that's another thing. Start them early reading. They love reading. If you take away the, too much of the video games, you know, and all of the TV, and you give them the books and you read with them and they see you reading, she loves reading. You know what I mean? If I don't take them to the library, they, they got a, a whole attitude. With me. So this is a good series. The who was, the what was, and the where was series. And it's so it teaches them about American history, you know what I'm saying, world history, things of that nature. So these are also. Uh, ch child appropriate for young readers. Whew. Okay, I'm done now, y'all. Uh, yes, their minds are sponges. So I went around the world and I, 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 I'm back again. This started off with the if then statement. Let me know your thoughts in the box. And then along the way, as I was talking, I gave you a whole lot of stuff that I didn't intend to, but hey, I like to substantiate, okay? I want to thank everybody for tuning in. This is Amuna Yisrael, Solonomics 101. You can go to www.the-so-center.com. If you would like to support, I see I like books, among other things. Um, the Soul Center has some stuff for you. So it's not just support me, it's support you in your healing journey. Um, and so at the Soul Center, this is a little public service announcement. At the Soul Center, I got to go to the Soul Center and find out what's at the Soul Center. Whew. At the Soul Center, there is, doo -doo 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 -doo. there are healing information. So like the Solonomics course, you have the how to flush toxic people. If you want to do a cleanse, it's springtime, y'all. If you think you're full of, eh, then do the C3 Challenge 30 Day Program. It helps to begin to flush out the toxins out of your colon. Um, it holds your hand along the way. It tells you food to be begin to eliminate from your diet and what to add into your diet um, for the 30-day challenge. If you can stand to lose a little of the stomach vibration going on here um, and you feel a little sluggish and you know you need to do a detox and there's so many choices out there, you might want to check out the C3 challenge. And if you want the uh, comprehensive list of food additives to avoid, period, even before you do the challenge, if you want the comprehensive list of the food additives that you need to avoid, period, that is also up there. If you want to uh, co-author a book, 
with your child. I think that's another beautiful teaching tool. We have done that as well. The name of the book is still waiting for part two, man. That thing was like two, three years ago. And there's just so much going on. But the name of the book was My Brother, My Keeper. It's over there somewhere. If you want to check that book out, it's on Amazon. I'm going to have to start doing this more so I can continue to support the thing. Um, I had my editor call me like, yo, where's part two of Island Love? You know what I mean? But so much stuff is going on for me right now. I'm really, uh, I have to raise the funds to be able to do part two of Island Love. It's called Island Twist. If you don't know what I'm talking about and you missed that, go back on the channel and you'll see uh, the playlist for Island Love and listen to that. And, um, oh yeah, the kidney cleanse is also on there, but you don't want to cleanse your kidney before you cleanse your colon. Your colon is the first thing. Your colon is king. They say the colon is king. The colon is king. So go on over to uh, the Soul Center and see some of the lovely things that we have done and labored for you because healing is the order of the day, right? And these are the things, these are the things that we have to go through for healing. So I'm almost finished. The river flows on. I'm like at the end. I think I got one more chapter to go. And then I'll, uh, whew, I don't know, man. It's just so much. And then I'll come back and talk about that. But I think I've talked about it a lot, but I guess I'll have to come back and talk about my review on that book. And then I'll move on to another. I did pull this one, but I think there's, I think there's one before this Harriet Tubman joint right here. There may be one before it. So I don't know. I'll see. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in on this impromptu video this here. Beautiful, rainy day. Everybody have a blessed day. Be safe. Be respectful, man. That's another thing. In order for us to build, to grow, to bridge, we got to learn respect. We got to learn respect. So everybody have a blessed day. I sign, I sign enough. Now. Nah. All right, one.